A Game of Thrones by author George R. R. Martin Prologue We should start back, Garrett urged as the woods began to grow dark around them. The wildlings are dead. Do the dead frighten you? Sir Waymar Royce asked with just the hint of a smile. Garrett did not rise to the bait. He was an old man, past fifty, and he had seen the lordlings come and go. Dead is dead, he said. We have no business with the dead. Are they dead? Royce asked softly. What proof have we? We'll saw them, Garrett said. If he says they are dead, that's proof enough for me. Will had known they would drag him into the quarrel sooner or later. He wished it had been later, rather than sooner. My mother told me that dead men sing no songs, he put in. My wet nurse said the same thing, Will, Royce replied. Never believe anything you hear at a woman's tit. There are things to be learned even from the dead, his voice echoed, too loud in the twilight forest. We have a long ride before us, Garrett pointed out. Eight days, maybe nine, and night is falling. Sir Waymar Royce glanced at the sky with disinterest. It does that every day about this time. Will could see the tightness around Garrett's mouth, the barely suppressed anger in his eyes under the thick black hood of his cloak. Garrett had spent forty years in the Night's Watch, man and boy, and he was not accustomed to being made light of. Yet it was more than that. Under the wounded pride, Will could sense something else in the older man. You could taste it, a nervous tension that came perilous close to fear. Will shared this unease. He had been four years on the wall. The first time he had been sent beyond, all the old stories had come rushing back, and his bowels had turned to water. He had laughed about it afterward. He was a veteran of a hundred rangings by now, and the endless dark wilderness that the Southern called the Haunted Forest had no more terrors for him. Until tonight, something was different tonight. There was an edge to this darkness that made his hackles rise. Nine days they had been riding, north and northwest and then north again, farther and farther from the wall, hard on the track of a band of wildling raiders. Each day had been worse than the day that had come before it. Today was the worst of all. A cold wind was blowing out of the north, and it made the trees rustle like living things. All day, Wilt had felt as though something were watching him, something cold and implacable that loved him not. Garrett had felt it too. Will wanted nothing so much as to ride hellbent for the safety of the wall, but that was not a feeling to share with your commander. Especially not a commander like this one. Sir Waymar Royce was the youngest son of an ancient house with too many heirs, he was a handsome youth of eighteen, grey-eyed and graceful and slender as a knife. Mounted on his huge black destroyer, the knight towered above Will and Garrett on their smaller garrons. He wore black leather boots, black woolen pants, black moleskin gloves, and a fine supple coat of gleaming black ringmail over layers of black wool and boiled leather. Sir Waymar had been in a sworn brother of the Night's Watch for less than half a year, but no one could say he had not prepared for his vocation, at least in so far as his wardrobe was concerned. His cloak was his crowning glory, sable, thick and black and soft as sin. Bet he killed them all himself, he did, Garrett told the barracks over wine, twisted their little heads off, our mighty warrior. They had all shared the laugh. It is hard to take orders from a man you laughed at in your cups, Will reflected as he sat shivering atop his Garin. Garrett must have felt the same. Mormont said as we should track them, and we did, Garrett said. They're dead. They shan't trouble us no more. There's hard riding before us. I don't like this weather. If it snows, we can be a fortnight getting back. It snows the best we can hope for. Ever seen an ice storm, my lord? The lordling seemed not to hear him. He studied the deepening twilight in that half-bored, half-distracted way he had. Will had ridden with the night long enough to understand that it was best not to interrupt him when he looked like that. Tell me again what you saw, Will. All the details. Leave nothing out. Will had been a hunter before he joined the Night's Watch. Well, a poacher in truth. Malister Freeriders had caught him red-handed in the Malister's own woods, skimming one of the Malister's own bucks, and had been a chance of putting on the black or losing a hand. No one could move through the woods as silent as Will. They had not taken the Black Brothers long to discover this talent. The camp is two miles farther on, over that ridge, hard beside a stream, Will said. I got close as I dared. There's eight of them, men and women both. No children I could see. They put up a lean-to against the rock. The snow's pretty well covered it now, but I could still make it out. 
No fire burning, but the fire pit was still plain as day. No one moving. I watched it a long time. No living man ever lay so still. Did you see any blood? Well, no, Will admitted. Did you see any weapons? Some swords, a few bows. One man had an axe, heavy-looking, double-bladed, a cruel piece of iron. It was on the ground beside him, right by his hand. Did you make note of the position of the bodies? Will shrugged. A couple are sitting up against the rock, most of them on the ground. Fallen, like. Or sleeping, Roy suggested. Fallen, Will insisted. There's one woman up on an ironwood, half hid in the branches. Afar eyes, he smiled thinly. I took care she never saw me. When I got closer, I saw that she wasn't moving neither. Despite himself, he shivered. You have a chill, Royce asked. Some, Will muttered. The wind, my lord. The young knight turned back to his grizzled man at arms. Frost fallen leaves whispered past them, and Royce's destroyer moved restlessly. What do you think might have killed these men, Garrett? Sir Waymar asked casually. He adjusted the drape of his long sable cloak. It was the cold, Garrett said with iron certainty. I saw men freeze last winter, and the one before, when I was half a boy. Everyone talks about snows forty foot deep, and how the ice wind comes howling out of the north. But the real enemy is the cold. It steals up on you quieter than will, and at first you shiver and your teeth chatter, and you stamp your feet and dream of mowed wine and nice hot fires. It burns, it does. Nothing burns like the cold, but only for a while. Then it gets inside you and starts to fill you up, and after a while you don't have the strength to fight it. It's easier just to sit down or go to sleep. They say you don't feel any pain toward the end. First you go weak and drowsy, and everything starts to fade, and then it's like sinking into a sea of warm milk, peaceful like. Such eloquence, Garrett, Sir Waymar observed. I never suspected you had it in you. I thought the cold in me too, Lord Link. Garrett pulled back his hood, giving Sir Waymar a good long look at the stumps where his ears had been. Two ears, three toes, and a little finger off my left hand. I got off light. We found my brother frozen at his watch, with a smile on his face. Sir Waymar shrugged. You ought to dress more warmly, Garrett. Garrett glared at the Lord Link. The scars around his ear holes flushed red with anger when Maester Eamon had cut the ears away. We'll see how warm you can dress when the winter comes. He pulled up his hood and hunched over his garin, silent and sullen. If Garrett said it was the cold, Will began. Have you drawn any watches this past week, Will? Yes, my lord. There never was a week when he did not draw a dozen bloody watches. What was the man driving at? And how did you find the wall? Weeping, Will said, frowning. He saw it clear enough, now that the lord had pointed out. They couldn't have froze. Not if the wall was weeping. It wasn't cold enough. Royce nodded. Bright lad, we've had a few light frosts this past week, and a quick flurry of snow now and then, but surely no cold fierce enough to kill eight grown men. Men clad in fur and leather, let me remind you, with shelter near at hand, and the means of making fire. The knight's smile was cocksure. Will lead us there. I would see these dead men for myself. And then there was nothing to be done for it. The order had been given, and honor bound them to obey. Will went in front, his shaggy little garret picking the way carefully through the undergrowth. A light snow had fallen the night before, and there were stones and roots and hidden sinks lying just under its crest, waiting for the careless and the unwary. Sir Waymar Royce came next, his great black destroyer snorting impatiently. The warhorse was the wrong mount for raging, but try and tell that to the lordly. Garret brought up the rear. The old man-at-arms muttered to himself as he rode. Twilight deepened. The cloud the sky turned a deep purple, the color of an old bruise, then faded to black. The stars began to come out. A half-moon rose. Will was grateful for the light. We can make a better pace than this, surely, Royce said when the moon was full risen. Not with this horse, Will said. Fear had made him insolent. Perhaps my lord would care to take the lead? Sir Waymar Royce did not deign to reply. Somewhere off in the wood, a wolf howled. Will pulled his garin over beneath an ancient gnarled ironwood and dismounted. Why are you stopping? Sir Waymar asked. Best go the rest of the way on foot, my lord. It's just over that ridge. Royce paused a moment, staring off into the distance, his face reflective. A cold wind whispered through the trees. His great sable cloak stirred behind like something half alive. There's something wrong here, 
Garin muttered. The young knight gave him a disdainful smile. Is there? Can't you feel it? Garret asked. Listen to the darkness. Will could feel it. Four years in the Night's Watch, and he had never been so afraid. What was it? Wind. Trees rustling. A wolf. Which sound is it that unmans you so, Garret? When Garret did not answer, Roy slid gracefully from his saddle. He tied the destroyer securely to a low-hanging limb, well away from the other horses, and drew his long sword from its sheath. Jewels glittered in its hilt, and the moonlight ran down the shining steel. It was a splendid weapon, castle-forged and new-made from the look of it. Will doubted it had ever been swung in anger. The trees press close here, Will warned. That sword will tang you up, my lord, better a knife. If I need instruction, I will ask for it, the young lord said. Garrett, stay here, guard the horses. Garrett dismounted. We need a fire, I'll see to it. How big a fool are you, old man? If there are enemies in this wood, a fire is the last thing we want. There's some enemies a fire we'll keep away, Garrett said. Bears and dire wolves and... and other things. Sir Waymar's mouth became a hard line. No fire. Garrett's hood shadowed his face, but Will could see the hard glitter in his eyes as he stared at the knight. For a moment he was afraid the older man would go for his sword. It was a short, ugly thing, its grip discolored by sweat, its edge nicked from hard use. But Will would not have given an iron bob for the lordling's life if Garrett pulled it from its scabbard. Finally, Garrett looked down. No fire, he muttered low under his breath. Royce took it for an acquiesce and turned away. Lead on, he said to Will. Will threaded their way through a thicket, then started up the slope to the low ridge where he had found his vantage point under a sentinel tree. Under the thin crust of snow, the ground was damp and muddy, slick footing with rocks and hidden roots to trip you up. Will made no sound as he climbed. Behind him, he heard the soft metallic slither of the lordling's ringmail, the rustle of leaves and muttered curses as reaching branches grabbed at his longsword and tugged on his splendid sable cloak. The great sentinel was right there at the top of the ridge, where Will had known it would be, its lowest branches a bare foot off the ground. Will slid in underneath, flat on his belly in the snow and the mud, and looked down on the empty clearing below. His heart stopped in his chest. For a moment he dared not breathe. Moonlight shone down on the clearing, the ashes of the fire pit, the snow-covered lean-to, the great rock, the little half-frozen stream. Everything was just as it had been a few hours ago. They were gone. All the bodies were gone. Gods, he heard behind him. A sword slashed at a branch as Sir Waymar Royce gained the ridge. He stood there beside the sentinel, long sword in hand, his cloak billowing behind him as the wind came up, outlined nobly against the stars for all to see. Get down, Will whispered urgently. Something's wrong. Royce did not move. He looked down at the empty clearing and laughed. Your dead men seem to have moved camp, Will. Will's voice abandoned him. He groped for words that did not come. It was not possible. His eyes swept back and forth over the abandoned campsite, stopping on the axe, a huge double-bladed battle axe still lying where he had seen it last, untouched, a valuable weapon. On your feet, Will, Sir Waymar commanded. There's no one here. I won't have you hiding under a bush. Reluctantly, Will obeyed. Sir Waymar looked him over with open disapproval. I am not going back to Castle Black a failure of my first ranging. We will find these men. He glanced around. Up the tree. Be quick about it. Look for a fire. Will turned away, wordless. There was no use to argue. The wind was moving. It cut right through him. He went to the tree. A vaulting gray-green sentinel began to climb. Soon his hands were sticky with sap, and he was lost among the needles. Fear filled his gut like a meal he could not digest. He whispered a prayer to the nameless gods of the wood, and slipped his dark furry of its sheath. He put it between his teeth to keep both hands free for climbing. The taste of cold iron in his mouth gave him comfort. Down below, the lordling called out suddenly. Who goes there? Will heard uncertainty in the challenge. He stopped climbing. He listened. He watched. The woods gave answer. The rustle of leaves. The icy rush of the stream. The distant hoot of a snow owl. The others made no sound. Will saw movement from the corner of his eye, pale shapes gliding through the wood. He turned his head, glimpsed a white shadow in the darkness. Then it was gone. Branches stirred gently in the wind, scratching at one another with wooden fingers. Will opened his mouth to call down a warning, and the words seemed to freeze in his throat. 
Perhaps he was wrong. Perhaps it had only been a bird, a reflection on the snow, some trick of the moonlight. What had he seen, after all? Will, where are you? Sir Waymark called up. Can you see anything? He was turning in a slow circle, suddenly wary, his sword in hand. He must have felt them, as Will felt them. There was nothing to see. Answer me! Why is it so cold? It was cold. Shivering, Will clung more tightly to his perch. His face pressed hard against the trunk of the sentinel. He could feel the sweet, sticky sap on his cheek. A shadow emerged from the dark of the wood. It stood in front of Royce. Tall it was, and gaunt and hard as old bones, with flesh pale as milk. Its armor seemed to change color as it moved. Here it was, white as new-fallen snow, their blackest shadow, everywhere dappled with the deep gray-green of the trees. The patterns ran like moonlight on water with every step it took. Will heard the breath go out of Sir Waymar Royce in a long hiss. Come no farther, the lordling warned. His voice cracked like a boy's. He threw the long sable cloak back over his shoulders to free his arms from battle and took his sword in both hands. The wind had stopped. It was very cold. The other slid forward on silent feet. Its hand was a long sword like none that Will had ever seen. No human metal had gone into the forging of that blade. It was alive with moonlight, translucent, a shard of crystal so thin that it seemed almost to vanish when seen hedge on. There was a faint blue shimmer to the thing, a ghost light that had played around its edges, and somehow Will knew it was sharper than any razor. Sir Waymar met him bravely. Dance with me, then. He lifted his sword high over his head, defiant. His hands trembled from the weight of it, but perhaps from the cold. Yet in that moment, Will thought, he was a boy no longer, but a man of the Night's Watch. The other halted. Will saw its eyes, blue, deeper and bluer than any human eyes, a blue that burned like ice. They fixed on the longsword trembling on high, watched the moonlight running cold along the metal. For a heartbeat, he dared to hope. They emerged silently from the shadows, twins to the first, three of them. Four. Five. Sir Waymar may have felt the cold that came with him, but he never saw them, never heard them. Will had to call out. It was his duty, and his death, if he did. He shivered and hugged the tree, and kept the silence. The pale sword came shivering through the air. Sir Waymar met it with steel. When the blades met, there was no ring of metal on metal, only a high, thin sound at the edge of hearing, like an animal screaming in pain. Royce checked a second blow, and a third, then fell back a step. Another flurry of blows, and he fell back again. Behind him, to right, to left, all around him, the watchers stood patient, faceless, silent, the shifting patterns of their delicate armor making them all but invisible in the wood. Yet they made no move to interfere. Again and again the swords met, until Will wanted to cover his ears against the strange, anguished keening of their clash. Sir Waymar was panting from the effort now, his breath steaming in the moonlight. His blade was white with frost. The others danced with pale blue light. Then Royce's parry came a beat too late. The pale sword bit through the ring now beneath his arm. The young lord cried out in pain. Blood welled between the rings. It steamed in the cold, and the droplets seemed red as fire where they touched the snow. Sir Waymar's fingers brushed his side. His moleskin glove came away soaked with red. The other said something in a language that Will did not know. His voice was like the cracking of ice on a winter lake, and the words were mocking. Sir Waymar Royce found his fury. For Robert, he shouted, and he came up snarling, lifting the frost-covered longsword with both hands, and swinging it around in a flat sidearm slash, with all his weight behind it. The other's parry was almost lazy. When the blades touched, the steel shattered. A scream echoed through the forest night and the longsword shivered into a hundred brittle pieces, the shards scattering like a rain of needles. Royce went to his knees, shrieking and covered his eyes. Blood welled between his fingers. The watchers moved forward together, as if some signal had been given. Swords rose and fell, all in a deathly silence. It was cold butchery. The pale blade sliced through ringmail as if it were silk. Will closed his eyes. Far beneath him he heard their voices and laughter, sharp as icicles. When he found the courage to look again, a long time had passed, and the ridge below was empty. He stayed in the tree, 
scarce daring to breathe, while the moon crept slowly across the black sky. Finally, his muscles cramping and his fingers numb with cold, he climbed down. Royce's body lay face down in the snow, one arm outflung. The thick sable cloak had been slashed in a dozen places. Lying dead like that, you saw how young he was. A boy. He found what was left of the sword a few feet away. The end splintered and twisted like a tree struck by lightning. Will knelt, looked around warily, and snatched it up. The broken sword would be his proof. Garrod would know what to make of it. And if not him, then surely that old Baron Mormont or Maester Eamon. Would Garrett still be waiting with the horses? He had to hurry. Will rose. Sir Waymar Royce stood over him. His fine clothes were a tatter, his face a ruin. A shard from his sword transfixed the blind white pupil of his left eye. The right eye was open. The pupil burned blue. It saw. The broken sword fell from nerveless fingers. Will closed his eyes to pray. Long, elegant hands brushed his cheek and tightened around his throat. They were gloved in the finest moleskin, sticky with blood. Yet the touch was icy cold. 